Okay, you guys ready to start this year in the Word? Yes. All right, well, let's grab our Bibles. As you know, our theme this year is going to be coming out of Psalm 19. So go ahead and turn to Psalm 19. If you don't have a Bible, there's folks coming around. Just raise your hand. By the way, if you don't own one, please keep that. I want you to leave here with a Bible, but if you just don't have it with you, leave it on the seat, and uh, we'll continue to reuse those. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great, great, amazing grace. That is why we stand here today. Everything is a gift of God. No rights, nothing earned, Lord Jesus. We know even the skills that we have, the eyes to see, the air to breathe, as part of your loving aloha to each and every one of us. And so now, Lord, at the beginning of this year, as we look at this verse that we will be saying at the end of each service, Lord, memorizing it, and, and as David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I sin not against thee. Lord, we're asking not for information, but the real incarnation of what this is testifying as we testify to it and proclaim it each week. And so, Lord, I pray we just begin to open our hearts and minds and understanding for a year of intimacy like we've never had before with you. That, Lord, we'll, we'll take a step into this relational realm beyond what we even thought was possible. And so that is my heart in prayer. So may it begin now as we go through this text, God. So help me and all of us now decrease, you increase in us. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be right in your sight. My maker, father, savior, redeemer, teach us. Your kids are listening. In your name I pray, amen. All right, well, we are in Psalm 19, and if you recall, we actually did study Psalm 19 back in March of 2022. Yes, we were still in the Psalms in 2022, and, uh, and that was when we first began to go through this series. And if you remember, and if you're taking notes, first thing I want you to jot down is Psalm 19 tells us of the reality of God, and he does it in two ways. It's understood in two formats. It's through creation and then also through his commandment, okay, through his revelation, through his word. Both of these, creation and his commandments, they reflect God's incredible beauty and his faithfulness. When he says the heavens declare the glories, and he goes on to talk about the faithfulness as the sun rises and the sun sets, so also is God's faithful to us and so forth. But now we're going to go into the second part, when God is revealing himself through his commandments, and that's where our memory verse comes from, and that's what we're gonna take a look at. So have your Bibles open, and we are at Psalm 19, and find me at verse seven, and this is our verse for this year. Remember as we read it, it says what the, what the word is, and then it says what it does. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring, how long? Forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is what? Great reward. All right, so here we see David taking this transition here. And the point, as I said in a moment, is just as the sun is the prominent feature in God's creation revelation, now the Torah is God's prominent element in his specific revelation. Specific revelation, meaning the vision that he will give to his people. And so when it says the law, it's talking not about do and don't. It's talking about the Torah. Now, he's going to use six words here to describe the whole of God's Torah, of his written revelation. We're going to see the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the fear, and the judgments. But what we need to understand is that the law, the Torah, is far more than just ten things. So often when somebody hears the law, they think of just the Ten Commandments. No, 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 no. The Torah, the commandments, the law, it's all of God's teachings for you and I. Amen? It's all of it. So what is it? Verse 7 says, the Torah of the Lord is perfect. What is it doing? Verse 7, hello, restoring the soul. Understand this. The law, the Torah of the Lord is, look overhead, it's perfect. What does perfect mean? It means it has been tested, it has been tried, and now we know it can be what? 
Trust it. And so the first thing he's saying is if we're going to go to this and say this is it, it's been tried and true. I used to challenge the YWAM students when they were going out. I'd say, hey, some of you, you've just gotten your act together in the last two or three weeks. And you're like, man, I want to go do something with God. And now you're going to go to a country where a person's been a faithful Hindu, a faithful Muslim for 25, 30 years in their life. And you're going to come in front of them and tell them that what they believe is not in fact true and that the word of God is. On what authority can you say that? And you see, the point of this is that it's not your consistency. It's God's consistency. It's the word of God's consistency and that it's tried and true. And we understand that. So the law, the Torah, it's, it's perfect doesn't have any errors in it. It doesn't have anything that it's left out. It's perfect. It's trusted. What does it do? It is restoring. And it restores. And literally that word means bring back. And I think for some of us here, we need to remember that. That God's commandment, what it does, its purpose is to bring us back. My point, so many think of it as being something that sets us out. Oh, you are bad. You are wrong. You don't deserve to be here. You are not worthy. That is the lie that the enemy has put upon this scripture and what the word of God's intent is. Its whole purpose, as I'm gonna show you in a moment, is to restore. And the first thing that it wants to restore is what? What does it say? The soul. The soul. Then the flesh. That, that whole sense and being of who you are. Everyone here who has had a taste of the Lord understands that something happens when you come into God's absolute atoning, unforgiving, I mean, totally his grace that is, that is surpassing all things, that there is nothing that he cannot forgive, there's nothing that he will not do. It is the unconditional, that's the word I was looking for, love for us. It restores the soul. When your soul says, I can be at peace with me because now I know God's unconditional love. That is the first part. Well, how do we get there? How does that happen? See, this is not your general understanding of the law, is it? Normally, it's like this cosmic cop with a holy radar try to bust us. This is what the law says. No, 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 no. What is it? Well, look. The law, so often people say, oh, it's about death. It, it's about no fun. It's about rules and regulation. That is not the purpose of God's written word. What is it? It's law. What does that mean? It's guidance. Guidance, knowing which direction to go so that you won't get hurt. What is the best way? I mean, most of us today, when we travel, we get into the car, we turn on our phone, and we go directly to Waze or whatever it is and say, how's the best way to get there? In fact, Cindy and I laugh all the time. As you can tell all the people that are on ways because they're using all the same back streets. You know, it's like this snake train and we're all going around and it's like, oh, you're on ways too. <laughs> Getting around the traffic. Okay, it's guidance. Interesting. Whose is it? It's of the Lord. And you see, that's the thing is once you start knowing the author, then you're going to find how much more you're going to want to trust the directions. And what is its character? Well, it's perfect. It's not something like, hey, here's a shot. No, meaning it is perfect. This is the best way, the only way. And what is the result? It's converting or restoring our soul. See, one of the things that we need to understand is this. I would always explain it this way to the junior hires when I would say, people get this idea of God's law as something that is restricting. But if I was to be playing a fun game, and you walked in the room and we're laughing and we're having a great time in this game. And you're watching, you're like, first thing you're going to ask is, can I play? And when we say, sure, what's the next question you're going to ask? What are the rules? And the funny everyone's like, oh, church, it's all about rules and regulations. Um, hello? You're going to ask the question, what are the rules? Because you want to win. You see, God's law is not restrictive. It's permissive. In the same way in the games that you're going to play, it's not a restrictive, it's this is the permissive. This is what you do, and this is how you have the most fun, the excellence, and you win in it. That's the purpose that David is helping us understand, that God's law is not a downer, it's an upper. Amen. It's up and about, and it's showing us ahead where we can go. This is why Paul spent so much time in Romans and in Hebrews trying to explain to us what is the first point of the law, clearly, to show us our true condition and our need for saving and a savior. Amen. Amen. See, you got to start there. If you still think I got this, you are going to limp along in here through life. You are. 
Your Christian walk is going to be something that's heavy, it's burdensome, having some failures, because you're still in the throne of, 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 of will, you're still in the throne of power. All of these things are restricting you rather than permitting you because we've yet to surrender to needing a savior. Not just a savior for eternity in heaven, but a savior from ourself here and now. Amen. And let me tell you, that's the true definition of heaven. Being set free from me. See, the point of the law is that the law is perfect, I'm not. Therefore, I need and the sooner you and I can get to the I can't, God says, great, I will. But as long as you and I want to hold on, he will let us. Then he goes on to say, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Think about that word, the testimony, the word witness. It's basically focused on what someone does. Do they keep what they say? Do they do what they say? Or are they a liar? Or are they a hypocrite? Well, he says the testimony of whom? The Lord, it's sure. My point, he's saying that Yahweh is Garant. 100%. He, everything that he says, he does, right? We've seen his faithfulness here. We've seen it here, here, and here. So we're going to trust it there. And so it's so good to know that the testimony of the Lord, Baga, is sure. I said last night, it was kind of like, you know, the, uh, the kids in the, in the 80s, where it's like, the, the, what was it, the Valley Girls, oh, so sure, for sure. For sure. How is God? For sure. That's who he is. He's sure. The testimony of our Lord is sure. But then what's so sure about it? It says, making wise the simple. You may not like this, but he's talking about us. Newsflash. Nobody here is omniscient. We do not know everything. Paul himself said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Meaning, let's just follow his example. Paul was saying, you want to know what to do? What did he do? How does God handle these things? Which is why I tell you, I would rather change the letter in the WWJD, what would Jesus do? I really think it ought to say, what did Jesus do? We can see the example of Christ. And so that is one of the first points of guidance is what did God do in this situation? How does that apply to me? Then he goes on to say in verse eight, the precepts or the statutes of the Lord are what? What's it say? Right. Restoring the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Here we see this statement, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, sometimes when we need a deeper revelation of Scripture to understand, it's always good to try to go sometimes to a translation that's closest to the actual original language. So, of course, this time we're going to go to the Pigeon Bible. Yeah. Check out this translation of this verse. I love it. When the one in charge tells something you got to do and you do them, that's the right thing for do. That makes you like throw party inside you. When the one in charge tell you how to live, no, man, no more nothing bad about that, you do them and you're going to understand how to live for real kind. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. I'm going to get them already. I mean, it's just boom. There it is. You like throw party inside. I don't know about you, but I don't see a whole lot of Christians walking around all the time with this attitude, chopati inside. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm, I'm surviving. <laughs> Just getting through, holding on to the feet of Jesus, brother. <laughs> What's that last night? You're going to understand how for live for real kind. This is what God's intention. So what are the precepts? Precepts are literally directions or regulations. And they said a principle instructing to do a certain action, which is to be obeyed by all in the same society of the covenant. Meaning if we all know red light, we stop at red light. There it is. The precepts of the Lord are right. What more is there to say? What God is saying, it is right. Why? Because he's been tested and it is tried and it is true. Amen. Why is it so important that the precepts of the Lord are right? Well, because you and I are living in a world of facade, so much misinformation and factless statements. You know, there are books that are in the university system that are challenging everything that we had ever learned before. And when you look at the very back of the book, it says, 
in this scholarly, academic, whatever, we have uh, chosen to not follow the, what is it, the mandate of having footnotes. So here's this one book that I have. I forget the title of it right now. And it's saying everything you learned about U.S. history is wrong and it's a lie. Here's the real truth. But by the way, we have no footnotes. And you would think that's okay if it's just on a bookshelf. No, it is actual curriculum in university. I'm like, are you kidding me? But you see, we don't challenge anything anymore. We just see these factless statements. But he's saying God's precepts, they are right. They are not wrong. They are tried and true. And by the way, what do these precepts do? It tells me. What do they produce? Rejoicing in the heart. Like Tropati inside. Does the word of God cause you to troll party inside? Does it cause you to feel, when you're in God's word, in scripture, that you feel this, whoa, like, wow. And, and, and time just kind of disappears, and all of a sudden you go, oh, I got to jump on a shower. I got to get to work. Because it's just, boom, it's just jumping out, and it's all over you. That's what the precepts of the Lord produce when we walk in the connection of who is the giver, what is the purpose of him giving this to me, and how is it applying in my life. That's why he goes on to say the commandment of the Lord is pure. And what does it do? It enlightens the eyes. That's what the word of God does. It allows us to get to the heart of anything, to understand it, to see clearly. That's what enlightening the eyes means. You don't just see what's there in front of it. You see the whole picture. You understand what's going on. God gives you vision when someone is saying something to know whether or not that is just what's being said or there's so much more behind it. It begins to give you this word of wisdom, word of knowledge as we walk in it. Now it says this is that the commandment of the Lord is pure. Well, think about how little that word pure is emphasized today. In fact, in many circles, it's mocked. And yet I found it to be most interesting that when the movie The Little Mermaid came out in 1989, I was 25 years old. I was ministering to a bunch of college students. And what blew me away was not just the elementary kids, junior high kids, it was the college men who were all in love with R.L. <laughs> But man, she is such a babe. Man, and, it, and I just started cracking up because this is like right in the heart of the full MTV movement where raunch, the full super duper sexy skirt, super short and all this. And it was just, raunch was displayed as this is what's beauty. And yet what I saw society was, they were in love with someone who was pure. It was her purity that caused people to be, Wow. I'm gonna tell you right now, pure never gets old and it's always beautiful. That's why you love a baby. There's just a purity about it. And yet the enemy has tried to camouflage that. The commandment of the God is pure. He goes on to even put it this way in verse nine. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now this is very interesting because we're used to hearing the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. That's the one you hear the most. Or the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. But here he says, the fear of the Lord is clean. Pretty much the same description of what we saw as pure above. Look, tahor, that's the Hebrew word for clean. It says this, not having any foreign particles or impurities, flawless, perfect, without defect of any kind. Huh, the fear of the Lord is flawless, perfect, without any defect. Why? Because it has no foreign particles or impurities. You see, it's saying that the fear of the Lord is clean. What does it do? It means it preserves and it protects. But you see, we still have to understand what I'm saying about this. Because remember when I've taught you on the fear of the Lord. When we hear the word fear, which is why we have difficulty when we hear these scriptures, we think of like Freddy Krueger, you know, you know, like, ah. Fear of the unknown is what we respond to. When we think fear, it's the unknown. It's like, boom, what was that? And you're running around your house with your meat cleaver and your babies. What was that? What was that? <laughs> you're afraid of the unknown. The person calls you and say, hey, we need to talk tomorrow. 
scenario running, scenario running. Fear of the unknown. The Bible's use of the word fear is the fear of the known. It's that of respect and revere, such as when I show up to the North Shore and pull up at pipe and see that it's eight foot plus sucking up and throwing out second, sometimes third reef. You stand there and you have a revere and a respect of what's going on out there. That's not an unknown, that's a known. Bugger, you're gonna get whacked. <laughs> that's what it's saying. When I understand the holiness of God and that his whole purpose is to give me guidance, provision, and protection, having that respect, it is what keeps me clean and pure. Amen. Such a different understanding of the word, the way in which we have got this mindset, how the enemy has caused us to believe God's intention in his word. The fear of the Lord, it says, is clean, and it says it's enduring how long? Forever. Talk about a warranty. Forever. The word of God is clean, and it makes us clean. Then it says the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. When it talks about the judgments of the Lord, let me say it this way. A fair judge is all any of us can ask for. Because there's not a single one of us here who believes we're perfect. We all know there's elements within us that are flawed. And so to stand in front of the holy judge, all we could ask for is a fair judge. But that's what the word of God does. It reveals my sin, yes, but it also teaches of the removal of sin by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you and me. So it shows me my need for a savior, shows me my need of where I am in my true condition, but it doesn't leave me there. How most people think, oh, it would just make me feel bad. Listen, the word of God does not make anyone feel bad. It's whatever you are having in your life, and when you hear the word of God in and of itself, because it is true, it is right, it's perfect, then your sense of conviction of what this is saying is true and where you are, that's when the enemy comes and starts causing you to feel bad about self. That's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is to draw you to God. Wow, Lord, yes, I'm not walking in that way. Wow, Lord, I don't have that that he's talking about. That's this conviction, not look how bad you are. Look how lame you're not like the rest of the people here. You can't really. Listen, voice one, Holy Spirit. Second voice, Satan. Understand the difference. So it reveals our sin but then it also shows me the way, the pathway, the way I am to walk and depend upon God. I was shown this verse as a young man and I kept it on the forefront of my mind. Psalm 119, nine. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Which is why your kahu says weekly, his word, his will, and his way. So now, They, verse 10, put a big circle there, they. What is that they? It's all six. The law, testimony, precepts, commandments, fear, and judgments. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is what? Great reward. They are more desirable. This sure doesn't sound like he was a burdensome, worrying something to David, does it? He didn't have to seem this thing that was hanging over him, this thing called law. No, no, no. For David, for him keeping God's statutes, his precepts, his commands, his ordinance, what did they do for him? They warned him of the dangers of the craziness of this life, and they brought him reward. Are you there? Do you understand God's purpose in your life? What is it too? It says right here, by them, what are we first and foremost? What is the purpose of the law? It's that you and I would be warned and that we would be wise. How? By them. Who? Us, your servant. And when? The here and now. By them, your servant is, present tense, warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Amen. 
great reward. Walking in a life that is thoroughly blessed, that you feel like tropati inside. And you want to invite others to this party because you recognize the blessing of walking right under that spout where his will, provision, and blessing come out. Now, when it comes to understanding this, this is the background behind what we will be saying this year at the end of our service. This is the guideline. Who is written by matters as much as what it's being said. And we're going to put our trust in this as we receive vision from the Lord. So let us now understand that. People are normally in two categories. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. You either find yourself today as being a reactionary or a visionary. Those are pretty much the two categories. As you see ahead, the reactionary, this is the individual who reacts to a situation and the circumstances around them. Something happens and then you respond to the something, whether it's the person, the thing, the event. And so you are reacting to such. You are being motivated, enacted, activated by something else that is happening. The second group is the visionary. The visionary relies on vision not incidents or environment. See, you and I are gonna come across situations every single day that we must decide whether we're going to be a reactionary or whether we're going to be a visionary, whether you're gonna to react to the situation or rely on revelation. My mom always put it this way to me. She said, son, are you gonna act or react? Which one is in charge? I said, whoa, because she saw her son getting hot head, getting all upset. I mean, come on, I grew up in an environment where I went outside, I was told I was a this, I was told I was that, someone wanted to give me cracks, whatever. And so I would be very much affected by what someone else thought of me, said, or did. And she showed me, when you do that, you are making everyone and everything else in charge rather than you. You are a slave to someone else's view, thoughts, opinion, the guy who cuts you off on the freeway and then sticks his finger out and gives you the bird and then you're like, ah, ah, and you're all upset. They're the one in charge of you. Are you going to be a person who's gonna live your life as a reactionary or are you gonna live in the big picture, peace that passes all understanding God as a visionary? And what happens even as a visionary is you begin to see that hurting people hurt people, wounded people wound people, and you begin to see much beyond the actions of an individual and you are no longer enslaved by them. Am I making sense to anybody here? You see, this is what we need to understand here. Are we going to stand up and fight for what we feel is our right and then be robbed, or are we going to let God, God? Perfect example, just within the last three weeks. A real dear friend of mine comes here, one love, he calls Cindy and I up in the morning and he says, Pastor, I just got fired. Well, the backdrop is he just told us two weeks ago that he just got promoted. He'd been at this company for over 13 years, started off just working, doing the forklifts, and then now he was, in, he was an area director. Now he became manager, and he's like, wow, praise God. Man, I gave my life to the Lord. You baptized me, and you know, we're doing all these things, and he's just praising God for these four years of what God has been doing in his life. And he says, wow, I just got promoted to be manager. And all of a sudden, what happens? Classic in Hawaii, you get the individual of the whole jealousy crew who didn't think he should be. See, he's, he's walking in God, talking about God, and people are like, ah. So all of a sudden, there's this irritation. So they come up with this whole coup to get him fired. And what it was is they brought an accusation that, hey, he was drinking on the property. Yeah, it was four years ago, BC, and it was four years ago with all other employees as well. But now the new management comes in and said, hey, were you drinking on property? And as a Christian, he goes, yeah, I was. I go, well, you're fired. You're fired. So he calls me up and he's like, man, I just got fired by all these people who didn't want me to be manager. And they were at the same party drinking. You know, you know what should I do? Should I bring this? So his first thought is, do I bring this to their attention? Do I come at me and, and, and put a, 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 a grievance against this and try to, try to fight this decision? And I said, well, that would be our first response, wouldn't it? But why don't we step, first step back and pray and say, which direction does God want us to go? Because this caught you by surprise, but not God. He's large and in charge. And he's like, right, right, so we pray. <laughs> Within three days, he's like, Pastor, I'm getting calls out of the woods for job interviews. I've had six. 
And he goes, and they're offering me more money, less hours, these different types of things. I mean, all these incredible things are happening because I was just waiting on the Lord. And then as I shared this incredible story with everybody last night, then he comes up and tells me, he goes, yeah, so I actually did choose this one job that not only pays better, the boss is a Christian. He prayed with me before the interview. I have less hours that I have to work and they gave me a company truck. He would have missed all of that if he went on the Haboot trail and wanted to fight. Just wait. What is the Lord asking of you to do? And you see, that is person who is visionary. Okay, Lord, this, I don't know what to do, but you do. I want to seek you for your guidance, your direction, your peace on this. Remember the word para that I taught you in, in a Proverbs 29, which says, without a vision, the people perish. Remember the word literally means become uncovered to be loosened or to be run wild, uncovered, you're wide open. And if you're loose, you're just being tossed to and fro by your environment. And how often I have seen this in my own life when I too am only reacting, relying upon the circumstances and what they portray. Let me say it again. When I find myself only reacting to the circumstances and what they portray, meaning All the information that is in front of me forces me to make the decision rather than stepping back and seeking the Lord for vision and wisdom. Are you hearing me? And what happens is when I do that, I run wild. And I say things I wish I wouldn't have said. Amen? You see, we all have a tendency to be reactionaries in this room. But praise God, his will is to turn us into visionaries. And that is what he's going to do. Remember when Peter went for the wrong sword? I've taught you that. There they are in the garden, and an entire army shows up to arrest Jesus. And what does the fisherman Peter do? He grabs a sword in front of an army. That's whacking around and cuts off a guy's ear. So beautiful that the Lord even just healed it so there wouldn't be four crosses but just three that day. But the point is, he went for the sword of the flesh, trying to do something to protect God, try to act in God's behalf. Wrong sword. Sword of the spirit is where he should have gone. Well, Peter almost did the same mistake twice, going for the wrong sword. What do I mean? Well, the other time is now when Peter is walking in the spirit of God and he's leading the Lord and now he's in Joppa. Many of you have taken you down to his house, Simon the Tanner's house, and it's right there near the waterfront. So very cool. He's traveled a long distance to visit Simon and he gets there and he's really hungry. And Simon says, why don't you just go up on the roof and chill and relax? We'll make some food and then we'll come get you. And he's like, great. Simon goes up on the roof and immediately just passes out and he starts to sleep. And what happens? He has this incredible vision, as you know, of all of this food coming down in a blanket. All of this food that would be considered unclean, okay? So he's got poor cash and all this crazy good stuff that, that's coming down and he's, he's seeing this food. Now, don't you love the practicality of God? Peter is hungry, so God speaks to him through food. He got his attention, didn't he? Wow. It's like he got a bento plate from God. You know, (laughs) here you go. And it says, take, eat. My point, God uses the world that we live in to speak to us in wonderful ways. See, Peter almost missed this that God was trying to teach him, speaking through a completely different set of principles. Are you aware that God speaks to you in ways that are beyond just churchy? See, if you're in a father relationship, you know, my wife and I, we can see things all the time. Oh, that reminds me of, or this. And it's the same way when you're in tune with the Lord and you're seeking vision and you're a person who now understands and hears his voice. God will speak to you through so many different things as we talked about, and we will more through creation, through other people, through circumstances. And one of the ways in which he speaks to me is to movies, movies. I mean, literally, here I am serving now 13 years in California after going to seminary and serving in this church in San Clemente and then in Santa Barbara. And people knew my love for Hawaii and wanting to go back home. They would say, brother, why don't you go back home? 
why don't you go back to Hawaii you love it so much? And I said, I would do, I would love to, but it would be sin. They're like, sin to live in Hawaii? No, it's sin to be anywhere other than God's will, and he's not done with me right now. This is where he wants me to be. And then one afternoon, I'm sitting and watching a movie called Nate and Hayes. And in this movie, it's a story. The main backdrop is about a pirate and a kid and all this other kind of stuff. But it has the tropical islands, the South Pacific Sea Islands. And so here are the grass huts and everything. And then there's the people and there's the missionaries that were there. And I'm looking at that and I'm just longing for, oh my gosh. It's just like I was back on on, on Molokai mindset, you know. Just seeing all the people that are there. And I'm like, man, that is so, so beautiful. And God, I wish I could be. And all of a sudden, I got the Lord say, you will be going home soon. I'm watching a silly movie. It says, you'll be going home soon. Within a year, we were moving to Molokai. Then when I was on Molokai, ministering there, and God is beginning to do things in there, all of a sudden, people in Maui and other areas and churches, they'd come over to visit, and they would see that I was teaching the word there, and they would say, hey, why don't you come over? Our church here needs, so all of a sudden, I had churches that were offering me to come to be the pastor there that had twice the salary and, and less the work, because they actually had staff and all these different things, and there was all of these opportunities before me, and I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And again, I'm chilling in the evening and watching a movie, a really silly movie uh, called Doc Hollywood. And the simple story in the movie is he thought he was going to go to Hollywood and be a famous plastic surgeon. Instead, he gets tripped up into a small town and understands the power and the beauty of ministering to people, not problems or money. And as he ministers to the people, he begins to fall in love with them and they with him and so forth. And as I'm sitting there watching that, the Lord just answers me and he says, Waxer, I want you to know this, that smaller isn't lesser. You know, your mindset is like, oh, I want to make a bigger impact. And you, hey, smaller isn't lesser. And I had such a peace. And when people say, hey, what are you doing on Molokai? Obeying God and having fun. And for some of you, that's for you. Smaller isn't lesser. You think that, oh, I've got to make my business this way, or I have to do this, or that. Says who? If it's not from the Lord, knock it off. No better than being right in this spout. But then God has taught me illustrations about ministry and such through other movies. And of course, you know, one of my favorites is Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. When he's had to go through all these things and he gets to that last point where he has to get to the other side where the, where the, um, the chalice is. And there's this huge distance and it says, unless a leap of faith, you won't be able to go. And he looks and he sees nothing but a huge hit. And yet... He's told to take a step. And if you know in the movie, he's standing there and he's looking around. There's nothing there. But what does he do? He looks back at the book because he can't see in his own realm. Anyway, it was so camouflaged in such a beautiful way. But now he looks at the book and it had been right here before and it had been right here and it had been right here. And who wrote it? His father. Because his father wrote it and he'd seen it trusted. He goes. And then he could see clearly. When I saw that, the Lord said, that's your life. You know me, you know my word, so you'll take a step. And only when you take a step can you see the rest of the plan. Amen? And like, these are silly movies, not by God's going, I want to bring vision to wax her. <laughs> but because of being in tune with Father, Father can use anything and speak to you. Amen? Amen. It's not just like, home, home, home. No! God is talking. Are his children listening? See, God is a creative God. We are all unique, and God will speak to each of us in different ways. How is God speaking to you? Do you know it? Do you understand it? Are you tuned in so you can recognize and receive his love letters, his little words of encouragement to you? Are we listening? Now, back to Peter. It is very, very important that you understand something if you know that story. Down comes all of these animals that are unclean animals, and God says, take, eat. And Peter, of course, says, no, I won't. So now, was Peter getting a mixed message because Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 say not to eat these things, and now here it seems like he's being told something in contradiction? The answer is absolutely not. Why? What was this? This was a vision. And in the vision, it was analogy. An analogy of what? Of Gentiles. He was using it to explain Gentiles. That's why Acts 10 says this in verse 15. And again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times. And immediately, what does it say next? 
the object was taken up into the sky. It was an analogy for him to understand what, say this with me out loud, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. What God has cleansed no longer. I'm talking to people right here, family that's online. You're always saying, well, I I can't do this, or I'm not worthy to do this, or if they really knew me, they wouldn't be. And we listen to all these lies of a validation of an action. Your validation before God and us is not any action, but who you are in Christ Jesus. And so what God has cleansed that no one consider unholy, no one is beyond God wanting to use them in a mighty way and speak vision, amen? So when I'm talking about these things today, it's not like, oh gosh, I wish I could, but I don't have that background. No, 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 no. God will speak directly to you. He's speaking to you and me that God will use us. And if you need a little reminder, check the dossier of the people whom God did choose in the Bible, and you'll feel a whole lot better about yourself. (laughs) You know, Abraham, a liar, David, an adulterer, Moses, a murderer, Jacob, a swindler, Isn't it so good that our Bible doesn't candy coat and lets us see God is the great one, not us? But he wants to do great things in and of and through us. So the question for you today is how do you become a visionary? Lord, I want to not be a reactionary. I want to be a visionary. So how do I become a visionary? Well, I suggest we take the same three steps that Peter did. So this might be worthy of jotting down. The first thing is prepare for the vision. You know, we have not because we, do you have any sense of time where you have actually gone with an expectation to hear from the Lord? See, so often Christians will say to me, man, I don't have this or don't have that. I'm like, but have you prepared yourself? Yes, he's gonna talk. Once you're tuned in to him and you'll be able to get his voice, he'll talk through everything you're driving, whatever it is, a song on the radio. But do you have a place in time that you have set aside? You see, Peter went up on the rooftop. He was where? He was in a quiet place. That's where it begins, family. It's best for vision and visionaries to be in a place of quietness and isolation. When Habakkuk was struggling with certain issues and questions, he went up into his high tower. And it is there that then the Lord spoke to him and gave him specific vision for him to write down and run with. That's in Habakkuk 2. The importance, family, of going to a house stop, climbing a tower, setting aside a quiet place and a quiet time to seek God cannot be overstated. To set yourself up, he says, seek and you will find. And for you to go there and say, Lord, I am here and I am not leaving until you have spoken to me and you then sit there and begin to prostrate yourself before the Lord. First things first are gonna come as first of all, you're just gonna get this overwhelming flood of his love and his presence, but then you're gonna sense even in your own life things that might need to be removed. Are you hearing me? It's a beautiful thing. I'll talk about it more of it in a moment. But prepare Prepare. Then the second thing is the illumination that comes through vision. See, what the Lord told Peter to do seemingly contradicted everything that he had previously thought. He even said, how can I do this? You might also be surprised by what the Lord will reveal for you to do when you're in the place of seeking his face. He may say, I now want you to go and make pono with this person or this circumstance. Or I may want you to sell everything that you have and start anew in a new place in a new land. Seeing that I have heard that voice three different times, and I'm going to tell you right now, we still got more junk than we know what to do with. Seemingly get all rid of it, and the Lord just continues to provide. Because with vision comes provision. This side got it, okay? With vision comes provision. That means what is needed and his protection for it. Hallelujah. Folks, the point is there will be fresh illumination in our lives and there will be challenging application, but we need this illumination. It is part of the most amazing part of our walk and nothing to fear at all. In order to receive this kind of illumination, church, we must be people who, like Peter, are willing to dialogue with the Lord about it. That's the key. Now, stick with me here. Hear me very clearly. 
So important. God speaks through whomever or whatever he chooses, but never will his word be in disagreement with scripture. Never. At all. It may be something difficult for you when you first hear it, but as I mentioned before, when God will call you, he will then give you the want to want what he is speaking to you. So how then do we know this illumination is from the Lord? That's the third step that's needed, confirmation of vision. I have way too many people running around saying, the Lord showed me this, or the Lord gave me this, or this is what I had. No, no, no. the next thing that needs to happen is confirmation of the vision. You see, after Peter was illumined by all that he saw, we read that Peter doubted himself. Well, duh, wouldn't you? I'm hungry and I have a vision of food. Okay, was that me or the chili? I mean, what's going on here? But Peter's vision was confirmed within seconds as there was a knock on the door and three Gentile men were there. The very thing that he was told was then confirmed. Family, the Lord will also give you confirmation of the vision if it is from him. Just understand that he will. If you and I truly take time to seek the Lord, he'll send confirmation in one way or another. And I'll talk more about those ways later. But just remember, even in earthly matters, God directs us to find confirmation. Remember, even in Matthew 18, it says, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two or more with you that the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be what? Confirmed. The Lord doesn't want us to flow from opinion. He doesn't want us to flow from a a, a feeling. Oh my gosh, how often do people, well, I feel this and I feel that. I don't care doesn't say the feeling will set you free. It's God's word, will, and way. Amen? So my prayer for us this year is that we would hunger and thirst for more, and that we would ask the Lord to instruct us, instruct us, and to expand us regarding vision, so that when we face this life and all the challenges that come with it, our response is not going to be based on the situation, but based upon the revelation that we've had of God. Amen? See, Moses, man, my little talked about this beautifully on, on New Year's Eve. He had a vision that God told him where to go, and the people are like, oh, you just brought us out here to die. Oh, you're just on a power trip. Who do you think you are? He wasn't derailed. Why? Because he had seen the vision. He didn't have to look outward. He looked upward. Amen? So can anything keep us from hearing God? Yes. Wrong attitudes. Resentment unconfessed sin in our life, which is why I'm saying when we sit down before the Lord, don't be surprised if first things first comes our loving Father reminding us of some things that we need to surrender, to let go, to give over. But man, when the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, (laughs) who would want to, I mean, the goal, so much better than anything I'm being asked to let go. Amen? Amen. Pure in heart, I want to see God. I want to know that I know that I have seen him help calling in his directions. So God then will show these to us and all we need to do then is confess, repent, and that will bring us back into this close Kononia relationship where we can hear from God. What do you mean hear from God? Well, I've told you already. He, first of all, he speaks through scripture. And I want you to know when I say speaks through scripture, I'm not just saying that you get the content of the text of what it's being said there. No, no, he will speak to you through scripture. You will be reading and God will speak to your heart. The word itself will jump off the page. It's called the rhema word, but God will speak to you and I when we're in the scripture, when we're there to visit with father, not read for information. Amen. Start off in the morning, Lord, as I visit with you now today. Open my heart and mind to hear from you. And as I mentioned, God will speak to us through prayer. Again, a reminder that prayer isn't a one-way conversation. God will speak to us through the Holy Spirit and Jesus when he speaks directly into our hearts. He'll speak to us through other people, through creation itself. As I said, you'll see the beauty of the Lord and something in us there. And you'll not only be drawn in awe, he will speak to his children when they're listening through worship. Oh my gosh, the beautiful thing that happens when we begin to center our heart on him through difficulties and trials. So many of you here know what I'm talking about. It was in the hardest and the most difficult time of your life that you heard God the loudest and clearest. Amen. It's just God using these things and through repeated circumstances, as we mentioned, and through dreams and so much more. 
And one of the ways that is so often overlooked how God speaks to us is also through his church, his physical community church. John Bevere quoted this recently, and I thought it was so beautiful, I needed to share it. He said, many feel that there are many ways to go to church other than physically walking through a set of doors and shaking hands with actual people. In a virtual driven world, many hear of Christ for the first time through media, but the importance of taking our faith out into a living and breathing body of Christ is crucial. Hebrews urges that we not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. God speaks to us today through his church. We must challenge ourselves to leave our devices and dive into God's mission for the church. There are lives that need our personal touch, our in-person hugs, our shared laughter and tears. The family that forms in a healthy church body equips and consoles us in a hard world with a difficult mission to spread the gospel. And I added in there, and we have a support network too. And what I mean by that is you're here and you're loving on and you're pouring into other people, but community comes around you. And like three or four years ago, and one of the members of our church, their house burned down to the ground. They weren't even home, so they grabbed nothing. And before I even got word of it and reached out to them, their life group had already surrounded them, given them a place to stay, given them the blankets, given them all this. So they were already being loved on because they had this community that was there of people, not something you can get through a device. When we show up, we give ourselves the opportunity for him to show us who he made us to be. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. We'll never know what part we are to play if we don't physically show up and listen. Amen? That is Father. That is his heart calling out to each and every one of us. Do you have the insight a revelation today in your life? Do you find yourself to be more of a reactionary, your mood being affected by either your spouse or others or situations around you? Or do you find that you have a peace that passes all understanding because you're walking in the sincerity of vision? What God has shown you and what God is showing you and that you have no fear because when you need any more information, any more direction, any more provision, he'll give it to you when you need it. You are at peace. That is my prayer for each and every one of us here today. Listen, God is speaking to each and every one of us. And so there are some of you here today who need to tune in. You need to reset that dial in your heart so that you can hear once again what God is saying to you. You want to be able to respond and face life as a visionary, not a reactionary. Today, when we take time in communion, draw that request. Ask of Father. Say, man, I am so, my knee-jerk reaction, my, my default is me first. And I need to turn that back into you first, Lord. Like my dear friend, I want to say, God, do I act in here or do I step back and let you do what you're going to do? Ask God to clear the mechanism in your heart and distraction that you would hear. But there are also some of you here today and with us online who you do not have the holy God dwelling within you. And if you do not have the holy God dwelling within you, then guess what? You cannot hear anything yet. But that can change right here, right now. By doing what the Torah says, acknowledging your need for saving and that Jesus is the Savior. Asking him to forgive you of your sins and then to be your Lord. That's a job description. That he would be the director, the guidance, that his Torah, his word will be that which instructs, fulfills, and causes your life to feel like you want to tropare inside. That is the offer that is available for you today. Puritan preacher Richard Baxter once preached a sermon to those in need of giving their lives to Christ. He said, heaven itself is ready. The Lord will receive you into glory of his saints. A vile brute as you have been, if you will be cleansed, you will have a place before his throne. 
his throne. His angels will be ready to guard your soul to the place of joy. If you would but sincerely come in and God is ready, the sacrifice of Christ is ready, the promise is ready, the pardon is ready. Then he asked his audience, but are you ready? And that's the question for you today. Are you ready to get off the throne and let God God and let you lead a life vision driven, not emotional driven? Amen. Aloha. I'm Anna, and I'm the media coordinator here at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill out a form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you will find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.